and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of Christ my Savior. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to welcome those who are watching this TV program this morning to stay with us and be blessed by the preaching of God's Word. In 1 Corinthians, the Bible says that God chose the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And by the way, I want to take this time to say Merry Christmas to all. And if you take your Bibles and open up to uh, John's account of the Gospel in chapter 4 with me, please. And starting in verse 7, There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, ask drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou would have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And the woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water, that I thirst not neither come hither to draw. Jesus was speaking to a Samaritan woman. The Samaritans, they uh, are the first ones to break God's command that thou shalt have no other gods before me. And they set up their own temple. They ordained their own high priests, and uh, the woman said, is, is Mount Gerson is the place where Jesus was crucified? And it wasn't. Is Mount Calvary, outside the city of Jerusalem. And so uh, she said, and Mount Gerson is where the people come to worship God? And it wasn't. It was in Jerusalem at the temple. But notice, Jesus loved this woman. He loved the Samaritans. And he wanted to bring them all together so that both Jews and Gentiles would be one in Christ Jesus. And such it is today when we know the truth. But about this water. You see, this woman would come back every day, and all would, and because they would thirst again, and they would need to drink water. But you see, Jesus has water that will cause you never to thirst again. You see, it's the water of life, and it will spring up unto us as a fountain of water unto everlasting life. That's what the Word of God is. It's living water, and it will spring up unto us into everlasting life. You see, but you have to thirst for it first. You got to want it, and then you got to drink of it. Now I know you're not going to drink, take this and drink it. But spiritually speaking, you're going to listen to what Jesus has to say, and because you know how much He loves you, how much He loves you, and what He's done for you, and what He promises He's still going to do for you, you follow what He says. You see, you follow Him to eternal life. This Jesus is a gift. Okay, this promise of eternal salvation is a gift. None of us deserve it. You know, far too many times in the world today, all across the globe, people think that they deserve what Jesus had offered them. But I'm telling you, we don't. 
Through the eyes of the Almighty God, all righteousness is as filthy rags, the prophet Isaiah said. And when I look up in the mirror, when I get up in the morning, these things I am reminded of. Jay is nothing without Christ Jesus, you see. My righteousness is a filthy rags. My opinion is no good, that, no better than yours. And they both ain't worth two cents, you see. But when we're covered by the blood of Jesus, that all changes. Okay? God sees us as his, does His own Son, Jesus Christ. We're put in the category with His Son, Jesus Christ now. We're the family of God. We're citizens of the kingdom of heaven. You see, this world is not our home. We're just passing through. We're pilgrims just passing through. I'm telling you, that's a gift. As we think about this Christmas season, especially the kids, okay? I remember when I was a kid, I remember there were different Christmases where, where it was just great. You know, it's, I remember them so great today they were that good, you see. And for kids getting Christmas presents under the tree on Christmas Day, it's great. It's a wonderful thing for them. They can't wait for it. They desire it and long for it. This woman longed for that dear everlasting water, okay, that she had never thirst again. She longed for it. Guess what? You should too. You should long for it. You know, I like banana pudding pretty well. Most people know that. You know what? You know why that kitchen out there is painted the color? Because on the paint can it said banana pudding. <laughs> okay? But the gift of God is greater than what we enjoy the most here on this earth. Okay? The gift of God. If you would, go to Isaiah chapter 7 with me, please. Some 1,500 years. I know I use this a lot, but it's good to remember. Some 1,500 years before it happened, the prophet Isaiah, the prophet of God, prophesied of this happening. <clears throat> now we, when we drive around during the Christmas season, we see these mangers that people have uh, put together and there's Joseph and there's Mary and there's baby Jesus and you might see a cow or a lamb or whatever in the barn there. Well, that's what these verses of scriptures remind us of during the Christmas season. Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. We know who that is. We, we sing songs about that. We see these, <clears throat> these images in people's yards of the manger. And uh, we know it's talking about Mary because Mary was a virgin. Mary had not been touched by any man. And yet she was pregnant with the Son of God because of the Holy Spirit. But the Lord himself will give us a sign. And that virgin shall conceive and bear a son. We know that son's Jesus. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And his name will be called Emmanuel. The Greek word for saying who Jesus is. Hold your place there. Don't lose it. Let's go to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew's account of the gospel in chapter 1. Here is where what... Isaiah the prophet prophesied about is fulfilled. <clears throat> now you kids might want to pay attention to this here because uh, when you talk about Christmas and uh, the manger and things of that nature, you're going to know where it's at in the Bible, okay? Most teachers don't even know that. In verse 18... Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, 
For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord, or of the Lord, by the prophets, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted is God with us. So that's what uh, prophet Isaiah was saying. This son that would be born, the Virgin Mary, his name would be called Emmanuel because he is God with us. In Isaiah chapter 9, and in verse 6 only, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. These are names given unto that son that was born by the Virgin Mary, Jesus Christ. If you go to Romans chapter 3 with me, please. <clears throat> And verse 23. Now our God, He did give us His Son as a gift because He loved us. But He did not give us His Son as a gift because we deserved it. And we kind of look at that today, you know, uh, with our kids. Uh, we go ahead and buy them Christmas and put it under the tree, whether they deserve it or not. And we do have that intent in mind. You know, there's a saying about, by the way, I don't believe in Santa Claus, okay? Uh, you can if you want, that's fine. But uh, Santa has a list, a bad list. And he goes down that list, and if, it, if your name is on that there, he don't stop by your house and deliver any gifts, okay? And so it is with our God. You see, there's a bad list. Now, we don't deserve the gift of God, the love of God. We don't deserve it, but he loves us enough to give it to us anyhow, okay? But it's conditional. He just doesn't give it to you and it's yours. You have to do what he says. You have to obey him. Follow his word until you leave this life or until Jesus comes back. Okay? This Christmas season, you know there's tr uh, presents under the trees. You know, mom and dad or whoever bought them and, and some people... Open them up a day or two beforehand, which is fine, or a day or two afterhand, which is fine. But anyway, whatever day it might be, you get up and there, there's that tree lights and stuff on that tree. They're glowing and there's those presents under that tree. And if it wasn't for mom and dad, there would be no breakfast, no dinner. We would just be opening presents, you see. And you have a joyful time, or you ought to have a joyful time. But what about the gift of God? that we don't deserve, but he gave it to us because he loved us. And he gives us the opportunity to enjoy that gift, okay? Jesus was never given for anyone to be grieved, anyone to be sad, okay? But to have joy, to have joy and be happy and enjoy life and be excited about life, you see? That's why God gave his son Jesus but in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, notice what God says about all people, okay? From the four corners of the earth, kings, presidents, all people, both men and women, this is what he says about them. For all has sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every man and woman that live or ever will live except for Jesus himself have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Sin separates us from God, you see. That's what sin does. It separates us. That's what the word death means. 
Dead, dying means a separation is taking place. Okay? And so because of sin, we're separated from God. Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 1, the Bible says that God's ear is not deaf that he cannot hear our cries. His arm is not shortened that he cannot be stand and save. This is because of your sins and my sins, your iniquities and my iniquities, that he has turned his face from us and he will not hear. You see, when God looks at you and me, and our righteousness is as filthy rags, but when we're baptized into Jesus Christ, and by the way, children do not need to be baptized into Christ, okay? They don't need to be baptized into Christ. I've had people at work talk to me about that this past week. I teach children that they don't need to be baptized, okay? Because they don't have nothing to repent of. They're not responsible for their sins, the things they do wrong. Now, I know parents like to say they are, but God doesn't look at it that way. I'm going to take God's word for it rather than men's. But all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All mankind, if it was for Jesus Christ, all mankind was separated from God. And if that separation remained until a person died or Jesus come back, they would be lost eternally in the pits of hell, in the fires of hell. And God loved this so much because He created you and me. He created the heavens, the earth, and everything that's in it. And the grace of His creation, the Bible says, is mankind. Because we were created in His image. The animals were not created in His image. The fish, the birds, neither the plant life, nothing was created in His image. But man was. The Bible says so. We are the greatest of God's creation. And so because of that, God loves us, and he does not want us to go to hell, to the lake of fire. You see? How many moms and dads will want to see your children or your grandchildren caught in a house that's full of flames and bursted with flames, and they can't get out and they're, high, they're crying and hollering, save me, save me? How many of us parents and grandparents would want to see that happen? We wouldn't. I'm telling you this morning, our Father in heaven does not want to see that happen to his children. He loves us that much. But he made a way. He gives us a gift. I use that word gift because it's the Christmas season. Most kids understand that. He gives us a gift. One we don't deserve, but he gives it anyhow, okay? Because he loves us. How many of you parents and grandparents would give your kids, your son or your daughter, to be crucified on the cross? What if Robert and I had come and grabbed one of your children and took them out and began to nail them to a cross? What would you do? You would stop us with every ounce of power, whatever you had, you would stop us from doing that. Because we don't love each other that much. But I'm telling you this morning, God loved us that much. He allowed His Son Jesus to be tortured and crucified on the cross for you and me. What a wonderful gift. Amen. How about look for that on Christmas Day under the tree, would you? Well, think about that, what I just said. There is a gift under the tree, the fruit of the cross. The cross is, in one part of the Bible, called a tree. Okay? Called a tree. And there's a gift there to fill the cross. And we should never forget that. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul said, For the wages of sin is death. That word death means separated from God. The wages of sin is death. The works that you and I do in this life, if they're sinful, if they're unrighteousness, if they're not what God wants you to do, they lead to eternal death, separation. The wages of sin is death. But, so I like when God puts that in there. Okay? There's an option. You have to take that. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. How many of us today in the world 
go to doctors and spend money on the herbs and go to the, the exercising places and this and that, try to make ourselves he healthier and live longer. And then God offers us eternal life where he says and he promises it that we can live eternally in paradise. What are we, what are we be seeking out first? Did Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33 say, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto ye? Yes. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You find a gift like that under your Christmas tree uh, when the Christmas season rolls around, okay? <clears throat> In Revelation chapter 20. Twenty-one. John got to experience something special. Okay? John was allowed to be taken up on an exceeding high mountain. And he was converted, however God does it, and to his spirituality. His spiritual eyes were opened. And John could look into that their heavenly city, the New Jerusalem. And he could see the walls were made all out of all uh, <clears throat> rubies and diamonds and jewels. Okay? And he could see the gold, streets of gold and they were transparent. He could see all the angelic choirs singing in there. I'd love to be able to hear that. He could see the throne of God. There was no sun, no moon there. For the glory of God was the light of it, and the Lamb was the light of it. John was allowed to go see these things so that he could write and write it down in a book for you and me to be able to just get a glimpse of what heaven's like. And also, the Bible talks about what hell's like too. Now what we need to do is put them together and make some comparisons. Which is the best gift for me? And nobody in their right mind is going to choose hell, okay? Nobody in their right mind would do that. We choose heaven. And since we all want to go to heaven, we all must want to do what Jesus says then. Okay? We all must want to study God's Word and learn it more and more and more. Do you know... When I first read, started reading the Bible, I was like most people. I just can't understand that. And there was just too many other things that I like to do rather than sitting here being confused. So I close it up and go do what I wanted to, get, want to do and wait until the next time if it ever comes. And then it comes and I open it up and some wise old man tells me, Jay, if you don't put nothing into it, you're not going to get nothing out of it. It's like a business. I'm sure Steve and his business, if he never went to it, okay, he went fishing all the time, and he never sunk no money into it, he let all the equipment run down and everything, what would happen to his business? Go down the drain. And I'm telling you this morning, that is what it is with our Christian life, with our Father in heaven. What you put into it is what you're going to get out of it. If you don't put nothing in it, you're not going to get nothing out of it. If you put everything into it, by the way, you'll get everything out of it. Okay? That's what God's saying this morning. You see, we've got to treat it like a business. If you want your business to be successful, give it your all. Give it your very best. By the way, this past year, did you give your very best to God? I'm sad to say that I didn't. And it bothers me. You know why? Because I'm reminded that He gave me His very best. He gave me His only begotten Son as a gift. Do you know that you and I can't earn salvation from Jesus Christ. If you and I had all the gold and silver in the world and all the money, paper money and the change and this and that in the world, we could never buy our salvation. 
I don't care if it's a trillion times a trillion times a trillion times a trillion, you never stop. You can never get your way into heaven with that. John 14, 15 says, if you love me, Jesus said, you'll keep my commands. You'll do what I say. Jesus' commands are not grievous, it says in the Gospel account of John. They're not grievous. You know, I think, I think people paint the picture of what the Bible teaches as being grievous, and it's not. They are unto eternal life, the Bible says. God's commandments are unto eternal life. You see, He doesn't just command us like presidents and kings does, okay, for their own benefit. He does it for your benefit and mine, unto eternal life. Think about the gift that God has given us. In Revelation chapter 20, starting with verse 1, John spoke what he heard and had seen. <clears throat> and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea or sea of mankind. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. And it's not talking about Jerusalem over the Middle East either. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. The church, Christians, are always considers, is considered uh, as the bride, the wife of Christ, okay? Both male and female in the church. And that's what John saw. The holy city, the new Jerusalem. What is the holy city in New Jerusalem? It's the church. It's the kingdom of God, the church. You and I. Christians, we need to wake up. We need to look at ourselves at God, the way God looks at us. We're the kingdom of God. We're the church. We're that new, new Jerusalem, that holy city that John saw. That's what we are. And from now on until the rest of the days of our lives, we need to understand that we're not in this lost and dying world anymore. We don't, we're, we're not here without any hope. We have hope in Jesus Christ. We have the promise of eternal life someday if we'll hold on to Him. You see, it's going to come quicker for some of us than, other than others. Tom many times said, don't hold me back. When I go, don't hold me back. Don't get in the way. Leave me alone, because I want to go with my Father in heaven. And he said that to her for many, 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 many times. And that's what you and I ought to be saying. We not look, should not look at this next week coming and, and the responsibilities that comes with it. We ought to be looking at it as, maybe it's going to be my time. But don't be quiet about it. Be jumping for joy. Praise God. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going with all the angels and the saints in heaven. I am never going to die. I am never going to cry again. There will be no more suffering, no pain. I won't need physical food anymore, not medicines. There won't be no hospitals, no policemen, no fire engines. You see? There won't be none of that up there. There won't be no sin or corruption up there. question is, is that what we want? If you say yes, friends, there's just no way around it. Quit fooling yourselves. You're going to have to study God's Word. You cannot get to it without God's Word. And neither can I. It's the study of God's Word. You know what? I've seen on the news. It wasn't the fake news either. I try to stay away from that. Well, they're holding rallies for young people. Okay, young people. And they're teaching them about George Washington and our forefathers and history about how our country come about. And President, Bo uh, President uh, Trump, he wants, he wants to put that in our educational system again, okay? So that when they go to school every day, they're going to be taught this. I think it would be great for you kids for that to happen. It would be one of the greatest things that could happen. 
That's what John saw. And he said, uh, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And I shall wipe away all tears from your eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. If you would, go to Romans chapter 8 with me, please. Everything we're talking about this morning has come from that gift that God has given to mankind. Okay? Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. If this wouldn't happen, Paul wouldn't have wrote, written about it and had it told unto us if this was not possible. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them are called according to His purpose. How did Jesus say that we love Him? By keeping His commandments. Doing what He says. So everything works out to the good for them who keeps His commandments. Does what He says. And that's not by itself and are called according to His purpose. And I have to ask you this morning, Christian friend, what's your purpose in life? Is it for what you want or for what God wants? So it's going to make a difference whether you get to heaven or not. You see? It's going to make a difference how your life here in this life goes. You know, there's a lot of us have been blessed this past week, haven't we? And God's worked some things out for us, hasn't He? Yes. Well, you're not coming back. Because of what that verse of Scripture says. All things work out to the good for them who love God and are called according to His purpose. How are we called? The Bible says through the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's how we're called. Okay? We're not called by some sign, some miracle. We're called by the gospel of Jesus Christ. You've been baptized into Jesus Christ this morning. You have been called by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Down in verse 32, 31, Romans chapter 8. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Think about that. David killed the giant, didn't he? The, the what was he? Goliath. David killed him. David was just a little lad. He killed him with a stone. They told him, when I kill you, I'm going to chop your head up with your own sword. He did. Because God was with him. David and God was enough to defeat that army. God in you, God in us is enough to overcome the devil to be victorious in this life and spend eternity with Jesus in the next life. Verse 32, He that spared not His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall we not with Him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? God's elect is God's people, the Christians. It is God that justifieth who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Okay? That's what Jesus does. He's like a lawyer. He's our go-between, between us and God. He pleads our case. That's what Jesus does. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation... Now we need to look at these Christians because these are some of the things that probably uh, confront us every day of our lives. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution 
or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or a sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Christians, the church, all is counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him, Jesus, that loved us. For I am persuaded, Paul said, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, the gift that God gave us. Satan has no power over you and me if we're covered by the blood. He can't do a thing to us. We cannot be lost unless we allow it to happen. Okay? We are saved, and don't matter what happens, unless we allow something to happen that would cause us to be in an unsafe condition. You see? Nothing else can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. And far too many Christians today in this life allow everything to defeat them. And we should be reading the scriptures that tell us these things. Okay? Nothing can separate me from the love of Christ. Nothing. Nothing. I've been a Christian for 41 years. Nothing has separated me from the love of Christ. Because I have followed what the Word of God said. Not on Joe Jones' merits. If it was up, up to me, I would have fell a long time ago and ruined everything. But because of the help that God gives me through His Word, through the Holy Spirit, I can be victorious in this life until I take my last breath or until Jesus returns in the clouds of heaven. See? I can be victorious. Now when we think about Christmas in that light, we have really thought about something, haven't we? I know uh, my, my grandkids, they got, they got more toys than uh, all the stores do. And they don't, know, they don't know where to start first. And uh, <clears throat> they play with them for about an hour and they're done with them. They want new ones. I'm telling you, we have a gift from God that is eternal. It should never come old hat for a Christian about Jesus Christ. It should not be something where do I have to get up on Sunday morning and come to the assembly or Sunday night or Wednesday night. Or it shouldn't be. Or do I have to open up the Bible and try to understand it? Or do I have to do I have to go to God in prayer? Do I have to go be with a lot of people call the church uh, hypocrites, okay? Do I have to go down and be with those hypocrites? No, you don't have to. You see, I'm in that same category. We're all hypocrite one time or another. No, you don't have to. You get to. It's a privilege. It's a privilege. And we get to do it as long as our God allows us to. Okay? And we're not to let nothing stop it. God didn't want Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, to stop his people from coming worship him. He went through great lengths to bring them out of the land of Egypt to the land of Canaan so they could worship him. And I'm telling you, he's still doing it for his people today, the church. Amen. Now, what it needs to take place now is every Christian needs to uh, take hold of that. Take the opportunity that God gives you. Every time we meet, you know what? There's teaching and preaching going on. Uh, <clears throat> One of these nights next week, we're going to just come together and play games and eat. Okay? It's not all about preaching and teaching all the time. You know, Christians come together. and I remember Larry, he used to tell me, Jay, why don't you come up here today? So I do. I come up there. He says, now I want you to let your hair hang down. Okay? Forget about all your responsibilities and just let your hair hang down. Well, that's what Christians need to be able to do. Okay? When we come together on Sundays and the times we have fellowship, this ought to be the one place we come together with Christians and quit worrying about all the big and doing around us. You see, God has given us a gift. 
But it lasts longer than the Christmas season, you see. It's for eternity, that gift is. What about you this morning? If you're not a Christian, the Bible says you need to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. By believing that message, one repents of their sins. Repentance is a change of mind and conduct toward the way that you're living, and you turn towards God. The Bible says one must be baptized by immersion to have their sins washed away and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit of God. Not to help you speak in tongues and do miracles, but to help you live a faithful life unto Jesus and His Word unto the end. If you are a Christian this morning, and through the preaching of God's Word, the Holy Spirit is nudging at your heart, because you know that you're not living just exactly the way that God wants you to. Well, that's sin, my friend. Sin is simply, in a nutshell, not doing what God tells you to do. That's sin. And you need to repent. Repentance is not a bad word. It's just the avenue that God gives His children to come back to Him. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, If we, we Christians, that's what it's talking to, if we will confess our sins to Him, speaking of Jesus, He is just and He's faithful to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's good news for the Christian. When I fall short of God's glory, guess what he will do for me if I will repent? Forsake that sin and return to him? He'll forgive me of it. Guess what? He won't remember it no more. And it's time for the church to think of it that way. When we've been forgiven, we shouldn't be remembering those old sins anymore or any of those sins. We shouldn't be guilty of those sins anymore. What about you this morning? Do you have a decision to make? Oh